It's been 10 years since 9-11 happened, and we are left with hundreds, if not thousands, of unanswered questions about the 9-11 attacks. A transparently fraudulent 9-11 Commission report, which purposely failed to even mention the collapse of World Trade Center 7, and a host of ridiculous, so-called debunking websites, forums, and other literature, which have done absolutely nothing over the past 10 years to debunk anything other than cleverly selected straw man arguments, and have failed to stem the constant flow of new 9-11 information which researchers have been uncovering and bringing out to the public. Instead, they continue to label truth seekers, including family members of people who died on 9-11, as conspiracy theorists, and devise clever propaganda designed to prevent the general public from looking any further into the evidence or the actual claims of the so-called conspiracy theorists. In this video, we will take a deeper look into the so-called investigations which have provided us with the official story and why they deserve a more thorough examination. The Bush administration initially delayed a 9-11 investigation for 13 months. A week after 9-11, letters containing anthrax spores were mailed to several news media offices and two senators who were perhaps a bit too vocal about opening an official investigation into 9-11. The anthrax used in the attacks was identified as an AIMS strain, which means it had to have come from the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases at Fort Detrick, Maryland. A member of that institute, Jerome Hauer, managed the National Institute of Health response to the anthrax attacks. Coincidentally, Hauer also warned the White House to start taking Cipro, an antibiotic which is effective against anthrax, a week before the attacks. Jerome Hauer also happened to be a managing director at Kroll Associates, which ran security at the World Trade Center up until the weekend before 9-11, when that role was personally handed off by Hauer to FBI agent John O'Neill, who would later die in the attacks, drawing strong suspicion that he was set up due to his knowledge of Al-Qaeda and the 9-11 hijackers, whom he was blocked from investigating while he was working at the FBI. In January 2002, President Bush personally asked Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle to limit the congressional investigation into the events of September 11th. The Bush administration only formed the 9-11 Commission after being prodded by the victims' families, who lobbied Congress for over a year to open the investigations. When the Bush administration finally did open a 9-11 investigation, it was described by some members as set up to fail. The President has said only a minority of the Commission can see a minority of the documents, and then they have to clear what they're going to say to the rest of the commission with the White House. If you're one of those four that gets to see these documents, would that change your opinion? No. They don't want any more eyeballs to see their documents than they can possibly get away with. It's a scam. It's absolutely disgusting. They even attempted to appoint Henry Kissinger, a known cover-up mastermind, as head commissioner. He resigned after victims' family members asked him sensitive questions about his connections to the Bin Laden family and the Carlyle Group. Philip Zelikow wrote the conclusions for the report before the investigation ever began, and even then, any areas which did not support the official story were neither mentioned nor investigated by the 9-11 Commission. Six out of ten members of that commission have discussed on record how the government lied about the official story and 70% of the questions posed by the victims' families were never answered or officially investigated. Instead of answers, we've witnessed a barrage of accusations, which have taken anyone who asks questions about 9-11, including over 1,500 professional architects and engineers, as well as family members of people who were murdered that day, and labels them as conspiracy theorists. Instead of detailed investigations which leave no stone unturned, we have instead gotten popular mechanics, and a barrage of so-called debunking media and literature, including a 10,000-page overly complicated and redundant scientific report by the National Institute of Standards and Technology based solely on unreleased and never peer-reviewed computer models, as opposed to actual physical data, debris, and evidence. It's important to look at what happened to the evidence from 9-11. The day of 9-11, most of the FBI was in Monterey, California on an agency retreat, this was essential for keeping the more experienced and honest members of the agency as far away from the crime scene as possible, while other agency insiders could be assigned to the investigations before their counterparts returned. Federal authorities such as FEMA and the CIA took immediate control over the crime scene and began whisking away evidence that very same night. Turner Construction, one of the primary contractors at Ground Zero, occupied the 38th floor of the North Tower and was involved in performing the fireproofing upgrades inside the towers. 
It has been noted that these upgrades were completed in the three years before 9-11 on floors that match up almost identically to the floors of impact and failure on 9-11. Once the cleanup was fully coordinated, the operations were consolidated under the control of two primary contractors, AMEC Construction Management and Bovis Lend Lease. These are the two companies that were originally assigned to the areas of Ground Zero that included the North Tower, AMEC, and the South Tower, Bovis. A truly surprising fact is that at the time of the attacks on 9-11, AMEC had just completed a $258 million refurbishment of Wedge 1 of the Pentagon, which is exactly where American Airlines Flight 77 impacted that building. Arguments over the size of the hole of the Pentagon and whether it was a plane or a missile are in my opinion a convenient distraction from the much bigger picture of why that section of the building was targeted and by whom. On September 10, 2001, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld announced that $2.3 trillion in unadjusted funds were missing from the Pentagon budget. The very next day, the offices whose responsibility it was for tracking that money down were destroyed when American Airlines Flight 77 impacted that very section of the building. The only off-site backup for the Pentagon's black budget financial records was a secure federal office building in the World Trade Center complex. Strangely, it too was destroyed on 9-11. World Trade Center 7 was the largest CIA headquarters outside of Langley, Virginia, and housed offices involved in several large-scale federal investigations into massive stock market and accounting fraud. Not surprisingly, World Trade Center 7 was the first to be cleaned up and the evidence destroyed at Ground Zero. So it appears that not only was there a cover-up after 9-11 to control the crime scene, destroy the evidence, and hide the truth about what really happened that day, but there were also cover-ups of earlier crimes which took place on the day of 9-11. It also appears that there were quite a few people who were killed in the 9-11 attacks themselves in order to prevent them from speaking out after the attacks. FBI agent John O'Neill, of course, but also several of the names of people aboard Flight 77 into the Pentagon who had top secret clearances and apparently knew too much. The Twin Towers were also full of a shady host of characters with connections to military industrial contractors, petroleum interests, the Department of Energy, financial institutions, intelligence agencies, and coincidentally, of course, the Bush crime family. These people obviously do not want to be investigated and would much rather have people waste their time arguing over pointless 9-11 anomalies like airplane crashes and controlled demolitions. They absolutely don't want people to follow the money or to start fingering suspects and naming names and connections. There's already a host of disinformation agents out there pointing researchers in the wrong directions. So here we are 10 years later, no legitimate investigation, multiplying layers of disinformation and various conspiracy theories, and the so-called 9-11 debunkers who consistently misrepresent the evidence brought forth by serious investigators. Here's Jim Meggs of Popular Mechanics promoting his new book on Fox News. How many times did we hear that uh, Building 7 was professionally demolished? And that was a tough one because, the, uh, because that building was not hit by a plane. In the end, it was, it was proven that it was the result of prolonged fires that weakened the internal structure of the building. And of course, uh, Rosie O'Donnell famously said, uh, with that, it's the first time in history that fire melted steel. Appendix C of the FEMA report shows one of the only studied pieces of World Trade Center 7 steel and clearly indicates sulfide eutectic formation and intergranular melting, which could not have possibly occurred in a fire, and no experiments have ever been performed which show that it is possible to melt and sulfidate steel in this manner, using fires and drywall gypsum, which contains small amounts of sulfur. Listen as Jim Meggs uses this same fallacious sidestep tactic, which can be found on numerous debunking websites, as well as Michael Shermer's article from Scientific American, all of which completely avoid the evidence that steel actually melted at the World Trade Center, and instead claim that the steel didn't need to melt for the building to collapse and the official story to be true. A lot of people had a hard time understanding how buildings could fall down as a result of fire, but what we found is it doesn't take temperatures high enough to melt steel, it just has to heat up the steel so it expands and then softens and weakens the structure until it collapses. Okay. That may be true, but you still didn't explain how the World Trade Center 7 steel from Appendix C of the FEMA report was melted with holes through it like Swiss cheese, for God's sake. And one of the new things in this particular update that you've got is there are some guys who claim to have collected some air samples. And oh. in that 
air sample was what? Some dust. They call it nanothermite. Now, thermite is a, is a compound that if you apply it in a certain way, it can actually melt metal in certain conditions. Okay. And they're claiming, they've given up on the idea there were bombs in the building. That was the original claim. Now they're saying, oh, there was some kind of nanothermite. And, and of course, you talk to demolition experts, the whole idea is, is ridiculous. Interesting. Popular Mechanics is now claiming that it is ridiculous to think that thermite could be used to demolish a steel structure. Yet in the November 1935 issue of Popular Mechanics, it describes how the Skyride Tower in Chicago was demolished in that very same manner, by engineers using thermite to melt through the vertical steel columns and collapse the structure. Pretty ridiculous, eh? But it, what it shows is how the conspiracy theories keep evolving as, as one gets knocked down. They never change their conclusions. They just come up with new evidence. That's probably because there's so much evidence, which we will continue to compile and make public until the truth is known and the perpetrators are brought to justice. Now they're literally claiming their best evidence is grains of dust found in the street near the ground. As if the size of the evidence has anything to do with how important it is. DNA is even smaller than the nanothermite particles which can be found uniformly throughout samples of World Trade Center dust. Yet DNA is used routinely to convict criminals in court cases all over the world. Just like the nanothermite evidence from the World Trade Center dust will someday convict the 9-11 criminals.